What is up, awesome people of the internet? And welcome to episode four of Women's Basketball Weekly, your weekly source for all things women's basketball. And for today's show, we got a lot to talk about, y'all. The Las Vegas Aces are still celebrating their championship. Chicago officially welcomes their new head coach. Clay Travis trolls the WNBA once again. We go back to 1869 and take a look at the first women's college game ever played. It also possibly seems like Angel Reese may or may not be heading into the 2024 draft. We will talk about that. Uh, Preseason All-Americans have been released. We'll take a look at that as well as the preseason top 25 list. Uh, We also take the time to remember the life and legacy of Georgetown's head basketball coach, Tasha Butts. We also, in this episode, debut a new segment talking all about high school basketball, um, specifically Overtime's newest endeavor. And we finish up talking about Euro Cup women. So yeah, a lot of stuff to get into. But first, uh, please give me an assist by liking this video. All right, let's get into it. So in WNBA news, the Las Vegas Aces are continuing to live their best life after winning the championship. They got a special invite to go to an Usher concert. At this point, I'm begging you, I don't beg, like, Usher, please, at at this point, at least not invite us to a show or something. Asia Wilson, I got your message. I see you, I hear you. Anyway, listen, I wanted to invite you to come see the show. Come see me do it my way here in Vegas. We stick together, we love one another. Congratulations on this day, and uh, man, I'll see you soon. And from there, they've had several appearances on major shows. Asia went on the Jennifer Hudson show. Sydney Colson was on The Daily Show. Yeah, they're just living it up right now <laughs> and milking this championship for all that it's worth. This past week, the Chicago Sky welcomed new head coach Teresa Weatherspoon to Chicago with a press conference. Here are some of my favorite clips from that press conference. As a result of our $85 million valuation this year, the Chicago Sky is now the second most valuable franchise in the WNBA. Oh, wow. Um, First of all, let me thank everyone in this building for coming, coming out to support this moment. It's a very, very big moment for all of us, not just for me. Uh, But I I, I say this all the time, and I want to make sure I continue to say this is because when God solidifies and glorifies your position and your destination, no one can take this away from you. It's yours. I am beyond excited to be here, beyond excited. Uh, the one thing that I will guarantee you, and you can write it in your books, that I will give you my all. I am all in. I am geared up. That is our campaign. We are geared up to do the right thing. We want to be different. So we got to do different and we got to look different. And we will be, we will take over this town. You can write it, you can mark it. What specifically did Sky Ownership sell you on um, that made you want to join the franchise in what Nadia described as being such a consequential time? It was very easy for me to hear the vision and where they were going and the players that I have with me. That was enough for me. I'm, it's, not, it's not very hard to sell me on the game. It's not very hard at all. Uh, to sell me on the game. I've, I've been there. I've done that. I understand what the game is. But I wanted to know the vision. I wanted to know where we were going and how we were going to get there. And the vision was sold to me quickly uh, because we're all on the same page. And that's the most important part. Uh, I think from the the very first conversation uh, that we had, it was like our energy just, we, we connected over energy. And I said, I've never had a coach that could really match my energy. And that's that was just something that really had really hit me. So just from the the conversations earlier, I kind of knew like more about her, and then we just kind of connected from there, and then stayed in touch. What are things that you've taken from being an assistant within the NBA and the Pelicans that you want to bring to the WNBA, and the differences between both styles of game that you think can infiltrate into the WNBA? The most important thing is relationships. You know, I've, I've learned along the way the X's and O's are the X's and O's. They're going to be able to to do the X's and O's and execute execute it properly. But the most important thing is to have a relationship. Find out what makes them go, you know, why they do what they do. 
And when you gain that relationship with them, you know, your conversations, your deepest conversations, your hardest conversations are easy. I am big on the community. I, I always speak this. If you want to be the talk of the town, you have to be in the town. Uh, so we're going to walk those shoes that you see between the four lines. Those shoes will be walking outside the four lines. We have to be a part of the community. We have to. It's important that we connect. Uh, have there been discussions in terms of how much impact, uh, how much of a role you'll have in terms of putting the roster together then uh, between now and then? The great thing about being here, this is, this is awesome, is I haven't been left out on anything. I know everything that's going on. I've been a part of everything that's going on. My voice has been heard on anything that's going on. So when you talk about that search, we are in that search. And it's important that we take our time and be thorough in that search because it's a huge piece of what we need to be successful. And that's where we are with that. And that's how we've approached it. And I haven't been left out on anything. And yes, I do have a voice in, in what may come, but I'll put the rest of that on Nadia. <laughs> um, just to echo what she said, uh, for sure, um, we included her on everything. Um, that's when you asked Annie, like, what have we sold? And part of it is your voice matters. This is a team and a high performing one. And everybody, to use your words, uh, is has a credible voice, not just players, but everyone who's part of the leadership of this organization. Because we, we all are in this together. Um, and then for whoever we end up deciding to choose to be GM will also be a critical voice as well. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, a collegial sort of experience amongst our leadership team. It seems like Angel Reese may or may not be heading into the 2024 WNBA draft. Uh, she recently posted this to Twitter uh, regarding uh, some of the new recruits that uh, LSU is getting next year. So is she going to the WNBA? Is she not? Um, I think she's gonna wait another year. Um, because again, she's a, she's just a junior. She could enter the 2024 draft if she wants, but I think she's going to uh, stay another year. Um, this is not an official word. We don't know for sure, but, you know, kind of taking uh, what what she's posted, uh, it, it feels like she's going to stay another year, but we'll see. What do y'all think? Let me know in the comments below. And continuing on with WNBA news on the not so good side now, uh, Clay Travis said this. I've said this for a long time. It is 100% true. A good state championship caliber high school boys team would smoke the best team in the WNBA. Let me repeat that because it's true and it's important. A good state championship level boys high school team would absolutely smoke the WNBA champions. Give me a team from California, New York, Texas, or Florida. I would bet my entire uh, savings in the bank that the boys' high school team would beat the WNBA team. All you got to do is say the WNBA sucks, and that's not permissible. And also, it's a function of how rigged Twitter is that I can trend by saying something that almost every sports fan in America agrees with. So thank you. I can't believe that I can win by simply saying things that overwhelming percentages of the American population agree with. So of course these comments were unfortunate um, and they were followed by a flurry of comments from the women's basketball world criticizing what he said um, as well as on the other side, people cheering along with uh, Clay's comments. So Clay Travis ended up doubling down on his comments by saying that he would put up a million dollars to see the matchup happen. And he even claimed that he had reached out to the WNBA and the Aces. Uh, y'all, if y'all don't know who Clay Travis is, know this. He is a very, very, very smart guy. He founded the conservative sports network OutKick um, and grew it to a million plus followers on YouTube alone. This guy knows what he's doing. He knows what appeals to both his current audience as well as his prospective audience. And he's totally fine with pissing people off. Uh, he knew what he was doing when he made those comments about the WNBA. Uh, he knew that his core fans would love it and others would be so enraged by the comments that they would blow it up on social and his prospective audience uh, would be introduced to him and they would start following him. Like it kind of makes sense in terms of a, uh, a, a way to get organic 
promotion of your brand. Because it's pretty easy for people to dunk on the WNBA. You know, they say, no one watches the WNBA. And they say, they would lose to dudes. But to be perfectly honest with you, uh, this is probably a controversial thing to say, but I'm really not sure who would win if the Aces played the best high school boys team in the country. And to be honest with you, I don't care what the result would be uh, because the WNBA is for females, not males. Males on average are faster, taller, more physical than females. Not always, but on average. Um, and the fact that, uh, and that's a fact, you know, and for sure it affects the way the game of basketball is played. Uh, whether or not you like it, uh, it is what it is, you know? Uh, but the idea of dudes coming out of the woodwork to dec discredit the growth and support of the WNBA is unnecessary, and it really is a cheap attempt for easy attention. Um, if you wanna watch dudes play basketball, you know, watch them play, watch the NBA. Uh, the sexes are separated for a reason. That is why you have women's and men's tennis. That's why you have softball and baseball. That's why you have women's and men's sports. The idea that the only way a women's team can have value is if they beat a team of dudes just doesn't really make any sense to me. Uh, we have to remember that at the end of the day, sports is entertainment and people have different perspectives. Uh, some people love golf and other people don't. You know, it doesn't mean that you need to demean people who play golf and like golf just because you don't like it. Uh, that, that doesn't mean that, 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 you know, it's inherently bad because you don't personally enjoy it. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly if that rant makes a lot of sense, uh, but, um, you know, it, I just don't like what, what Clay Travis did. I mean, it, it's fine to not like the WNBA. It's totally fine. But to, uh, but to put a challenge out there, like, like, oh, you know, um, they better take this challenge and not like, why? Why, why does a women's basketball team need to play against dudes? Like, I, I don't, what's, I mean, if they're going to do that, they might as well just join the NBA or join a, a men's professional team. Like, the WNBA exists so that women can have a chance to play basketball at the highest level. That's the whole purpose of it. You know, if, if, if that wasn't necessary, then they'd play in the NBA. Uh, but it's necessary. Uh, the sexes are separated. And it's a thing for every single sport out there. And so I, I, I don't think it's a, it's a, it's as much of, as a dig um, as he was intending it to be. Um, ultimately, I think it's our job as women's basketball fans to keep spreading the word about the sport that we love um, and to actually get support, uh, you know, support teams by going to games, buying merch, watching games on TV. You know, women's basketball will continue to grow uh, you know, uh, we'll continue to spread the word to other people who, um, have, who don't have a like or dislike for women's basketball. They just don't know about it. And, and, and if, as we introduce it to more people, uh, that'll continue to keep the game growing and women's basketball will be growing for decades and decades to come, uh, regardless of what people like Clay Travis and others have to say about it. Uh, the women's game is popular. It's getting a lot more popular as time goes on. You see the final four numbers in the NCAA tournament. Um, you know, um, WNBA numbers are, are up this year. Yes, they're not the best, uh, but it's growing. Um, and, and it's important for us to, to continue to support this league that we love. Um, so that way, eventually, the, the more and more the WNBA grows, the less and less we hear of, of other people sort of trying to... Um, to, to, to make the, the league, you know, um, look bad and, and whatnot. So yeah, those are my thoughts. Uh, let me know guys, uh, what do y'all think about Tra Clay Travis? Um, do you, what do you think about what he said and the response that it got? Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. All right, guys, now on to our in the history book section, uh, where this week, uh, in honor of women's college basketball starting next week, we take a look at the first intercollegiate women's basketball game ever played. So on April 4th, 1896, at San Francisco's Page Street Armory, history was made. Nine Stanford women took the court to play against nine women from the University of California. 
Uh, in attendance was 700 women spectators who paid 50 cents uh, and came out to watch this game. Men were banned from attending this game for modesty reasons, so some men decided to climb the roof of the building to watch through the windows. The game of basketball was still fairly new at the time. Uh, it was just four years earlier that James Naismith actually invented the sport, uh, and so far the sport was primarily played by men. The game of basketball was so new that even the Cal men didn't even have a, a team. They didn't even play their first intercollegiate game until 1907. So the women for sure were ahead of their times. The rules that Naismith came up with were adapted by Sandra Beerson at Smith College to ensure that the game remained ladylike. And it banned things like stealing the ball and other rough play. Now here were the rules. Uh, this was a nine on nine game. Yes, you heard me right. There were 18 players on the court at the same time. Uh, they, played they played two 20 minute halves. Uh, each half of the court was zoned in thirds according to the so-called half court rule um, that prevailed in the women's game until the 1960s. Three players were consigned to each zone uh, and each player could possess the ball for five seconds um, at a time um, and they could only dribble twice. Only the home players at the net could shoot and they couldn't shoot with two hands. Very interesting rules, right? Uh, now let's talk about this game and I specifically want to make a uh, reference Mabel Craft's article in the Chronicle. So one thing to note is that men reporters also were not allowed to attend. So Mabel and other women journalists covered the game for San Francisco's top three newspapers. Mabel said that the crowd jammed the gallery at the armory and roared until the glass doors in the gun cases shivered at the noise. Yeah, you heard that right. They were playing in a real armory with real guns in, in the building. <laughs> Uh, there were many calls for time and some disputes. Enthusiastic captains claimed fouls and some were allowed, sometimes with a slump and a slide. Three, goals, uh, three girls would dive for the ball and end up in an inextricable, and end up in an inextricable heap of red, white, and blue. In less time than it takes to read it, they were all planted firmly on their two feet, flushed, perspiring intensely in earnest and oblivious of everything except that ball. She wrote that basketball wasn't invented for girls and there isn't anything effeminate about it. It was made for men to play indoors and it is a game that would send the physician who thinks that feminine organization so delicate into hysterics as he tried so hard he tries so hard to perpetuate. The game itself was very low scoring uh, with the final score of Stanford two, California one. So keep in mind that at this time, backboards were not invented. Uh, and so if you ever heard of something like something called netball uh, that, play, that they play in Australia, this is kind of similar to that. You literally have a hoop sitting on a pole with nothing else. Um, so you basically have to have a perfect shot in order to actually score. Even with this low scoring game, uh, this was an historic game and quote, the first great struggle in feminine athletics. And also a thing to note is that this game was not just the first uh, women's intercollegiate basketball game. This was the first women's intercollegiate game, period. So these ladies at Stanford and Cal, they made history on a lot of fronts. The hype for this game, while it was great at the time, it didn't last long. In December, 1899, uh, Stanford would shut down their women's team and they said it was for the good of students' health and for the unpleasant publicity accompanied by the contest. However, uh, the Stanford players did not you know, hang their heads. They decided to form an independent Palo Alto club, which kept competing. Cal's team, on the other hand, was, 
was a bit more well regarded, they would go on to continue to play basketball and they would even be undefeated in their 1897 season. Um, and they even got recognition in the school's yearbook, the 1900 Blue and Gold Yearbook, which was a big deal at the time. Um, so that was the story, guys. Um, that was your first intercollegiate women's basketball game ever in 1896. Did y'all know about this game at all? Um, did you enjoy hearing um, about it? Um, you know, the looking at some of the writings of, of that game, you know, it's kind of cool to read. Um, and it also kind of hard to believe the way that they were playing basketball because it's so different than how we play basketball today. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Um, you know, does it surprise you that Stanford and Cal were the first teams to play against each other? Um, again, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you love this section, please let me know by giving this video a like. So NCAA updates for y'all. So college basketball officially starts next week. And before we get to the games, let's talk about the AP preseason's uh, women's basketball All-American team. So this team features Iowa's Caitlin Clark, Andrew Reese of LSU, Elizabeth Kitley of Virginia Tech, Stanford's Cameron Brink, Paige Beckers of UConn, and Mackenzie Holmes of Indiana. And if you're saying, why did you just name six players? Well, that's because Elizabeth Kitley and Mackenzie Holmes were both tied for fifth place. Kaitlyn Clark was the unanimous pick for preseason um, for the preseason team this year, um, and she is now the three-time preseason All-American. Um, and she also won the AP Player of the Year last season, if you don't remember. So Kaitlyn Clark is for sure riding high right now. So the AP preseason All-American honorable mentions include UConn's Aaliyah Edwards and AZ Fudd, LSU's Haley Van Liff, and Anissa Morrow, and UCLA's Charisma Osborne. And with the season right around the corner, this also means that the rankings are out. So here are a list of the top 25 uh, teams so far. LSU, UConn, Iowa, UCLA, Utah, South Carolina, Ohio State, Virginia Tech, Indiana, and Notre Dame round out the top 10. And I will say it's not that big of a surprise, the, the total list. However, I will say that I'm a little bit surprised that Iowa is at number three on the list because as we know, they lost a huge piece in Monica Sinano um, due to graduation. And so um, I'm not sure if I would have put them at number three. Um, but what do y'all think about this list? Uh, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. All right, y'all, next Monday officially starts the women's basketball season for college. Um, and there are a bunch of games that you can watch. Here are the four games that I personally plan on looking out for. So we have LSU versus Colorado. That game is on TNT at 6.30. We have USC versus Ohio State. That game is at 1 o'clock on True TV. We have TCU versus Oral Roberts at 4 o'clock on the Pac-12 network. And then finally, we have South Carolina versus Notre Dame. That game starts at 12 and it's on ESPN. And a thing to note about that game, this is actually the Paris game that we've been, we've been talking about. So lots of hype about this one particular game in Paris. All right, guys, if you want to watch a good amount of these games on, on the schedule for, for that first day, you need to pay for ESPN+. Plus. So I personally do not have ESPN+, Plus, and I'm still trying to debate whether or not I want to shell out an additional $11 a month to watch these games. Um, so I don't know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But if you, if you do wanna watch these games, if you look at, look at the, um, the list of games, you'll see that most of them um, require you to have ESPN Plus. So if you have ESPN Plus and you plan on watching these games, let me know in the comments below. All right, moving on. Last week, women's basketball lost a giant of the game when Tasha Butts, the head coach, of Georgetown women's basketball died at the age of 41 after a two year battle with breast cancer. So as a high schooler from Georgia, Tasha was a baller. Um, she was a consensus all American and she was also uh, the Georgia Gatorade player of the year. She remains the all time leading scorer at her high school as well. 
In college, Tasha played for the legendary coach Pat Summit at Tennessee, and during her time with the Lady Vols, the team had a record of 124 and 17. And as a senior, she earned all, AC, all SEC second team honors and averaged 10 points a game. Tasha was eventually drafted in the WNBA in 2004. Uh, she was drafted in the second round to the Minnesota Lynx, where she would go on to play 30 games for the team. Um, after her time with the Lynx, Tasha returned to Tennessee, where she was a graduate assistant for the school. Uh, during that time, Tennessee would have a 55-1 and SEC record and make it to the Final Four. She would eventually go on to play overseas and briefly played for the Charlotte Sting and the Houston Comets. Uh, she would start her coaching career in earnest in 2008 when she joined UCLA's coaching staff, and she stayed there until 2011 when she joined LSU to become an assistant coach there until 2019. After LSU, Tasha joined, joined Georgia Tech um, and their coaching staff, eventually getting promoted to associate head coach in 20, uh, 2021. During the 2021 season, um, Tasha revealed that she had been diagnosed with advanced stage metastatic breast cancer. And the diagnosis, you know, even with that diagnosis, she still played her role. She still did her job as, as a coach for Georgia Tech, um, helping the team earn an NCAA tournament berth. Uh, in April of 2023, this year, Tasha was announced as the new head coach for Georgetown women's basketball. In a press release announcing her passing, Georgetown's director of intercollegiate a athletics, Lee Reed, said, when I met Tasha, I knew she was a winner on the court and an incredible person whose drive, passion, and determination was second to none. She exhibited these qualities both as a leader and in her fight against breast cancer. This is a difficult time for the entire Georgetown com community and we will come together to honor her memory. It was announced that Darnell Haney has been named Georgetown's interim head coach for the season. Uh, the Hoyas and the Big East Conference is gonna continue to honor uh, Tasha's legacy all season and make sure to keep her Tasha Tough initiative uh, going to help bring awareness to early cancer screenings and detection. So from all accounts, I can see that Tasha was a great player, she was a great coach, and she was a great human being. Um, it's sad to see that she had passed, she passed away, um, especially at such a young age, only 41 years old. Um, and it's just a reminder to everyone that cancer is serious business. No matter what age you are, um, cancer can affect you. So please make sure that you're going to your doctor on a regular basis. Uh, one thing to know is that this month in October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Um, and Tasha died one day after South Carolina and Rutgers played a preseason game to honor Nikki McCray Pinson. Uh, she was a, a famed uh, player and coach who passed away in July, also from breast cancer. Um, I will feature Nikki McCray Pinson in a separate edition of In the History Books because she has had a very uh, legendary career in her own right. Um, you know, guys, breast cancer is serious, you know, um, so women go to the doctor, get yourself checked out. Like this is no joke at all. And dudes, same thing. Everybody go to the doctor, um, get yourself checked out because, you know, early detection is very, very important for cancer. So, um, please make sure y'all do that. Um, and prayers for Tasha Butts, um, and her family also for Nikki McCray Pinson and her family, and for all the people um, who, are, uh, who, who, who are affected by cancer um, and, the fam and the families that have to help, um, help them cope or even unfortunately bury some of their, um, their family members. Sad situation, but guys, you know, if, if you can go to a doctor, please go to a doctor, make sure you're getting yourself checked out. All right. On to a new segment uh, that's going to be focusing on women's or girls high school basketball. Uh, so I know I don't talk that much about high school basketball, 
Uh, but I did want to let you all know that Overtime is actually creating a girls high school basketball league called Overtime Select. This league is going to be featuring some of the top basketball players from all across the country. And for those who don't know, Overtime is a huge, huge, huge uh, sports media company that basically is on all platforms. Overtime is uh, pretty well known for for their boys and men's um, you know basketball. Uh, they have a 16 to 20 men's pro basketball league called Overtime Elite that is pretty popular. Um, in 2019, Overtime had their first takeover event featuring some of the country's top girls basketball players. Um, overall, the company is big. They have over 85 million total followers on social media. Um, they're a big deal in the world of basketball. And they are becoming an increasingly bigger deal for girls and women's basketball. So this league is gonna start during the summer of 2024. Um, and it's already has, it already has some well-known basketball players in, in the high school game. You have Aliyah Chavez, you have Jasmine Davidson. You also have the number one player in the class of 2026, Jersey Robinson. There's no word on who else is going to be participating in this league, uh, but we do know that this league is going to feature eight teams that will play a total of four weeks during the summer. Um, and this this isn't just a summertime endeavor, though all the games will be in the summer. Uh, players who participate will be able to take part in a year-round virtual mentorship program where high school players can get advice from current and former players like Simone Augustus, Brianna Stewart, uh, uh, Kalia Copper, as well as agents and business executives. Uh, Overtime Select will also have a summit on public relations and media training, as well as financial literacy and the business of basketball. Now, when asked about Overtime Select, Brianna Stewart, who is affiliated with the brand, said this, with Overtime Select, you have more competitions, more, chan more chances where you can see players play different players playing, building their brand, because now that's a thing in a high school. Yeah, she's right. This is, high school is becoming more and more um, of a way for players to get paid and for them to get really, really serious in terms of playing professional. Um, and so, yeah, this is a thing. The creation of Overtime Select, it sort of just solidifies that the, the company um, as well as other companies are starting to realize that there is money to be made in girls basketball. Now that girls are getting way more opportunities to play uh, these big time leagues, they're gonna have more, more of a name, a name for themselves. You already have Aliyah Chavez, who feels like she's everywhere right now. <laughs> like she's everywhere as a high school player. Like I see her all the time on social media and that's going to be the trend. You're going to start to see more and more and more high school players that have these crazy highlight reels. You know, they, some of these players have more highlight reels than WNBA players. Like, it's crazy. Um, but that's where the trend is going, you know, and, there, and there's big money to be made. Um, overall, I think this is great. This is overtime select league is going to be great for women, women's basketball and girls basketball. Um, however, I do worry about these high school players playing all year round basketball because I think it can lead to further, further injuries down the road um, and it sort of lessens you know uh, the chance that girls will be playing multiple sports you know in, in high school I played a lot of sports um, and I feel like it overall helped me to be one a well-rounded person but also I didn't really get injured at all because I worked different muscle groups all year round playing different sports and I think that that's something that that's these players nowadays, they don't really have that because all they're doing is just basketball. And so to me, that's a that's a little bit of a concern, but we'll see what happens. Um, overall, I think this is a good thing. Um, what do y'all think? What do y'all think about Overtime Select? Uh, do you think do you think you're likely to watch these games? Uh, I think they will be on on um, available somehow, um, whether uh, likely on the Internet. Do you all plan on watching? I personally, I think I do plan on watching. Um, what do y'all think about more companies investing in girls and women's basketball? Uh, do you think eventually this hype will transfer uh, and, and continue with these players as they eventually go into to the WNBA? Like, I'm just imagining when Aaliyah Chavez goes to the WNBA, like, you know, she's gonna have 
a huge fan base that had followed her all the way from high school all the way up. And, you know, that'll be pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, guys, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you want to learn more about uh, this league, check out the Athletics article about it. I'll link it in the description below. All right, now on to overseas talk. And this week we are taking a look at Euro Cup women, Euro, Europe's uh, second tier basketball division. Uh, in a previous week, I talked about Euro League, um, and Euro Cup is just a notch below that. Uh, the league was created in 2002, and it featured it featured a lot of well-known former women's basketball players, including Ann Waters, Tisha Penichero, Cynthia Cooper, and lots of others. The league has had 16 different winners, uh, and the best teams so far historically have been Dynamo Moscow and Galatasaray. Euro Cup's regular season features a total of 48 teams, so a lot, uh, and the teams have been split into 12 groups of four teams. When the season is over, 32 teams will advance to the playoffs, um, and they will continue on from there. So far this season, uh, they have played, most teams have played three games. Uh, week three top performers include Asia Shepard. Asia played for the Aces back in tw uh, 2022. Uh, Holly Winterburn, she never played in the WNBA. We have Canadian Kayla Alexander, who is currently teamless in the WNBA. We have Kelsey Bone, who is also teamless in the WNBA, and Maisha Hines Allen, who plays for the Washington Mystics. And I just want to point out a couple of other players that I, I think you all might be interested in. So the Chicago Sky's Dana Evans is off to a great start with her team uh, Beskatas. Uh, so far, she's averaging 29 points a game, six rebounds, and five assists. Destiny Henderson, formerly of the Sparks and Fever, is also off to a good start. She's averaging 20 points so far with five rebounds and 4.8 assists. Chloe Bibby, if you don't remember her, she was very she was a very good player for Maryland. Um, she is currently averaging 20 points and eight rebounds for her team. Now, if you are interested in watching Euro Cup games, you can find those games on YouTube and I will link the location below in the comments. And finally, um, continuing on with our Euro Cup news, uh, bummer news to share with you all. It was recently re reported that Michaela Cowling, who plays for, I'm gonna butcher this name, VBW Arca Ginya, um, this is a team in Poland. She was attacked in a music club by a 48-year-old 48 man who was working as a security guard. The attack left her with injuries, including a fractured eye socket, and her attacker was eventually later arrested. Uh, the attack happened after one of her team's matches in Euro Cup. For those who don't know, Michaela played at Cal, uh, and she was drafted by the Connected Sun in 2018. Six days ago, she posted on IG saying, last Wednesday while entering the women's restroom at a music club, I was followed inside and aggressively confronted by a club security guard. Despite assurances from myself and others that I was where I was supposed to be, he then proceeded to become extremely physical, uh, physically violent after I stayed in my place. Uh, she also said that she's gonna be remaining in Poland and uh, she would like to continue to play with her team. If you want to read her full, um, uh, if if you want to read her full message, you can you can see that on on the screen right here. And also, I will post a link to her Instagram in the description below. Um, I will for sure be praying for Michaela's full recovery from this injury. Um, well, guys, uh, that ends this week's edition of Women's Basketball Weekly. I thank y'all so much for, for lasting this entire episode. Um, you know, if you love this video, please hit me, hit, hit me with a like. That would be awesome. Um, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please subscribe. Um, and let me know, y'all, what did y'all think about this week in women's basketball? Um, what do y'all think about the stories that I covered? Um, did you learn anything? Did you find anything interesting? Uh, let me know in the comments below. I thank y'all so, so much for watching. Um, if you haven't shared this video with someone, please share it. Um, I really want to make this a, a one of the top um, women's basketball uh, shows in the world. Um, and so I, I would love for you all to share it. And I would love your feedback on how I can make this this uh, the show better. 
you know, what, what would you like to see differently? Um, let me know in the comments below. Um, I thank y'all again so, so much. And until next time, guys. Bye.